Thank you all for joining us. Um, we're just gonna take a couple of moments to welcome everyone into this live recording with one of my favorite people in the whole entire world, uh, Robert Egger. Um, we're all in for, I, I know, I don't even know if treat is the right word because it's, it's more than that. Um, what we are going to be in for is just a lot of, um, knowledge dropping, mind expansion. Um, and I hope that we all, you know, can can gain from from this conversation today that I know I've been very much looking forward to. So uh, welcome everyone. You know, um, we're just uh, having the audience come on in. And so I know it takes a little bit for all of us to virtually get settled. Um, and I also wanna say hello to all the future listeners of this recording. I hope that you are also having a great day. Um, and um, maybe soon we can all come together, um, you know, in, in real space together um, for a variety of the different things that Food Recovery Network is, is working on and striving towards. Um, and happy Monday. It's a little chilly here in Washington, DC, where uh, at least Aaron and I are, um, you know, Robert and Elaine are in other parts of the, the US, but um, welcome everyone. So um, I guess I will I will go on ahead and get us started because you know again a, a lot of the conversations that we uh, have at Food Recovery Network um, is absolutely with our live audience um, in consideration. So again, thank you all for being with us. And then you know we know that a lot of times in the, the very busy worlds that we all live in that people um, tune in at a later date. So we'll go ahead and get started. And at Food Recovery Network, um, we start conversations like this with a land recognition. Um, and we will do that for the Piscataway Kanoi tribe. That is the, um, it is a modern day uh, tribe and also their ancestors who are stewards of the DMV area. So that is DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, so thank you to the Piscataway Kanoe for being stewards of our land, our water. Um, and so I wanted to kick us off with, with our conversation today. Um, we are talking with the incredible Robert Egger, um, just somebody that I have the utmost respect for. Um, I've learned so much from over the years. Um, and we're, we're talking about advocacy. And in just a second, Elaine is going to release a poll um, just to see where we're all at in, in terms of the understanding of the word advocacy. Um, and for Food Recovery Network, advocacy is really critical to how we're doing our work. Um, so when we think about the fight against hunger um, and the fight against climate change, and when we think about the, the intersection of hunger and climate change, and um, you know, for us with FRN, our equity walk, when we think about environmental racism and all these different factors, advocacy plays such a key role in how we plan to work towards um, feeding everyone who is hungry in the US with recovered food, and our indicators of that being, yes, that we are able to recover this precious food, our bedrock work, but also our systems change work, which is um, the economic security of the 42 million people who are currently food insecure today. Um, advocacy is a way for us to put forward new structures and policy, to redesign structures around policy, to start fresh so that um, we have different methods as a culture, as a community, as a society um, that brings that number down to zero. And our conversation today is going to help us um, to explore how advocacy is a tool that we can all harness um, to support the economic security of the 42 million people who are currently food insecure. Um, so thank you all who had an opportunity to, um, to take that poll. Um, with that, a couple of things. I'm Regina, <laughs> I'm the executive director of Food Recovery Network, and it is a, a role that I've had the honor of, of having for almost seven years now. Um, and I also wanted to introduce Elaine, who is on the FRN team. Yay, thank you, Elaine. Um, so Elaine will help us today. And you may have seen Elaine um, at a variety of our other um, webinar conversations with releasing polls and making sure that we are monitoring the chat. 
um, and just making sure that all the tech um, runs smoothly for all of us. Um, so thank you so much, Elaine, for that. And Elaine is our program associate here at FRN. Um, and then it is my pleasure to introduce Aaron, who is um, FRN's program manager here at FRN. And, and Aaron has been on the team for, for a number of years now. So I've had the pleasure of working with both Elaine and Aaron, um, but specifically Aaron um, in a variety of different capacities. Um, and so, Actually today, because this conversation is so geared towards um, all of our, our students and our alums and the, the people that are very much the engine of the work of FRN, um, Aaron is actually going to go on ahead and be our incredible moderator for the conversation with Robert. I'm of course gonna chime in because I got to chime in. Um, I have so much love for, for Robert, um, but I just <laughs> wanted to let everyone know that as you know, as our program manager, you know, Aaron really is um, here to support all of you, you know, as we are striving, as we're working, as we're thinking of new ideas, you know, as we're coming together across our chapters. And again, the alumni work that we're doing, you know, Aaron really is that person who's holding us all together. So, so thank you so much for that, Aaron. Um, and so I, I think um, at this point too, we're ready for our second, um, our second poll. So again, this just helps us take the temperature, um, get, get a sense of who's in the room um, as we move forward within our conversation together. So thank you all for just um, you know, being sure to um, fill out those polls. And I think um, if it's okay with you, Erin, when I turn things over to you, um, maybe we can give a sense of what, what the, the, the results of the polls are. Um, and before I... Um, turn things over to Aaron um, for, for a second. Um, I, I did wanna talk about um, the fact that FRN, we are supporting two federal policy initiatives um, that we're, we want to introduce to the entire network. Um, and so there's live time going to be opportunity for all of you to actually have a hand at uh, you know, some of the advocacy work um, that we are, are talking about. And so I'll turn things over to Aaron to give more detail about those initiatives. Yeah, thanks Regina. Um, so first of all, thanks everyone for filling out these polls. This is just helpful for us to kind of get a sense of who's in the room and how comfortable or experienced you might feel with uh, getting engaged in advocacy work. Um, and so for the first poll, uh, most folks like Elaine mentioned in the chat have said that they have some experience in advocacy. And a few of you said, you're brand new to advocacy, um, so that's great. I didn't see anybody reply that they have a lot of experience in advocacy, um, so good to know as we're heading into our, you know, the bulk of our conversation today. And I can also see right now that uh, the interest level in different types of advocacy is pretty varied here. I feel like we have a, a majority local interest, some at the state level and fewer at the federal level, which Again, I think like given the work that we're all so passionate about and engaged on with food recovery and you know ending hunger for our communities, um, this makes a lot of sense to me. So thank you all so much for sharing uh, and for being here. Like Regina mentioned, um, so we are supporting two federal policy initiatives. Um, the first one that I wanna chat about is for the um, strengthening the legislation for the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act, which I'm sure that all of you here are probably familiar with in some capacity because of our work in food recovery. We've been working with uh, our partners at Weight Watchers to um, help support just strengthening the wording of the bill so that it encourages more food donors to actually donate their surplus food we want to make sure that there's nothing holding them back, no fear of liability uh, to make sure that everyone would be donating. Um, so this is like, to me, kind of a no brainer <laughs> for us to all get behind and support uh, to, you know, make sure that we can continue in our work and expand our work in this way. Uh, so if you have the opportunity, we would be delighted to have you join us in this effort just by signing uh, a petition to, to show that sign of support. So I think Elaine has added that link into the chat here. Um, so during the call today, please do sign that. Uh, it really helps all of us to continue in this work. So thank you. And Regina, I'll, I'll hand it back to you so we can get started with the bulk of our conversation. 
Great. Thanks so much, Erin. So, you know, as Erin said, lots of ways to get involved, lots of ways to begin our practice of um, beginning advocacy. Um, and as we said in the chat, looks like many of you are at least, you know, my, familiar with, with advocacy and are active in that regard. So that's amazing. Um, and really quickly, I did want to say hello to Alexi, who helped with our food recovery during the Super Bowl in LA. So it's so nice to see you, Alexi. And also Elise, um, both Alexi and Elise are FRN alums. So thank you so much. Elise is currently on our host committee for um, our Irvine host committee to help support FRN in our gleaning efforts um, in California to feed more people faster. Um, so thank you both. Um, and without further ado, I wanted to introduce Robert Egger, the reason why we are all here today. Um, I've known Robert even before my time at Food Recovery Network. When I first landed here in DC about a decade ago, um, Robert immediately was somebody that um, you know supported me individually. Um, you know, as um, I made my way through through my career, and you know, ultimately came here to Food Recovery Network. Um, many of you might know Robert, who is the, the founder of DC Central Kitchen, which is alive and strong here in DC and is such an important nonprofit here in our community. And then Robert went on to found um, the LA Central Kitchen. Um, Robert has written you know, a book and he, I, I really cannot stress enough how much space and time Robert has given to individuals, which you won't find on his bio, um, to people like me and others, you know, where he will take the time to have you know, hour long conversations about you know, questions that we might have to really get us moving in the directions that we need to go. Um, and currently Robert now sits on the board of directors for World Central Kitchen with Jose Andres, and I know is really supporting the guidance of that really important um, nonprofit and the efforts to help support relief during disasters that might happen. Um, and so without further ado, I wanted to you know, say hi um, to Robert, and I know Robert has a lot to share with us, but Robert, I mean, would you mind when you say hello to everyone, just like giving us a little bit of insight into, um, I know I only touched a little bit onto your bio, but anything else you wanted to, to add to that? And as it relates to, you know, your commitment to advocacy and to young people over the years. Well, you know, thank you very much. And it's an honor to join you all. And I look forward to engaging with everyone in the audience. So please feel free during the course of our conversation to post your questions. I mean, I really, I really enjoy the back and forth. Um, you know, man, I was, I, there's a, you get a certain age and there's a, a, a thought about, you don't want to act young, but you want to recall and remember and, and hold tight to the dreams of your youth. What did I want to be, you know, when I, when I got older, who, what kind of man did I want to be in the world? And I hold on really tight to that. And one of them was, you know, I had, I reached out to people when I was young to ask for advice. When I first started DC kitchen, no one had ever done, you know, a food recovery program attached to a job training program for men and women who are homeless or out of prison or from a drug treatment program. And I had a lot of elders um, not give me the time of day. And that really shocked me because I assumed that, that people in our biz would be wildly open and supportive of a younger person. So I really dedicated myself at a very early career to be, you know, again, available and free um, all, all the time. I never, I try my best never to say no. But um, early on after we opened LA Kitchen, I also realized that I had a unique vantage point and that I was in the nation's capital at the advent of interest in food waste, the beginning of the internet, um, cable television, the, the rise of the celebrity chef. Um, and I got a lot of attention, but then I realized there were people who were never going to get the same opportunity. They didn't live in Washington, D.C. They might be tons smarter than me, but they were never going to get the television or the, or the media attention I did. So I really dedicated myself to this kind of metaphorical 49-51 split and that 49% of my time was going to be dedicated to DC Kitchen or whatever my, my you know, personal thing was, but that I had to submit metaphorically to this 51% that was the bigger, more important cause. If I just absorbed all that light, um, I'd be part of the problem. I'd just be a cog in the machine. But versus that idea of like, I am one of many. And if I get an opportunity, I'm going to reflect light on the broader movement and our broader ideals, not just take it all in and say, aren't I great? So that's been a, a real guiding force. My kind of my North Star on my compass is, you know, I am one of many um, and it's important always to be available and open and open source 
about your knowledge. So let's get it on. I love that. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, and I feel like everything that you just said like sets us up so nicely for the first question that I'd love to ask you. Um, again, I think that we all recognize you've really dedicated your life, your career um, to eliminating poverty, supporting better food systems, and really just being an advocate in your life. <laughs> um, what got you interested in policy and advocacy to begin with? Well, you know, it's funny, I really wasn't at first. I mean, um, I grew up a little bit, to be quite honest, a little bit jaundiced about advocacy. A lot of the people I, I heard were talkers. And I, and I, you know, my mom used to say, you can talk or you can do, you know, and I was always a doer. I liked, I liked people who advocated through action. So part of my, my first construct of advocacy was the way I led my business, the way I led my life. I tried to, um, you know, the kind of friend I was. I think we underestimate the power of your own personal advocacy, the, the, the example you set. Um, I'm going to give props to Regina as a classic example is here's Regina. Now she's, you know, the, the CEO of the organization. She's been in charge for a long time. She could have moderated this, but she took it upon herself to pass the baton down, you know, and give Aaron, um, you know, the opportunity to, to lead this. And that's, that's a powerful example. To me, that's advocacy because it shows that you actually live and, and breathe what you talk about. Talk is cheap. You know, so that idea of action. Um, but, you know, it's funny because I worked so hard in my early career um, opening the, the DC kitchen. And I'm going to stop for a second and go back one little iota here, because a lot of the reason I started the kitchen and a lot of the work I do is more about justice than hunger. Um, you know, I grew up and again, I, not to be the old dude, but I, I grew up at a really weirdo time in that I was 10 in 1968, and you all all remember being 10, and your kind of eyes are opening to the bigger world, you know, and you, you're starting to see the world as it exists, not as you kind of hope it'll be or, or assume it is, but as it really is. And when I was 10, Dr. King and, and Robert Kennedy were both assassinated within two months of each other. And that was a profound moment. And as a young kid, I, I couldn't get over why two men who spoke so powerfully um, about you know, kind of racial reconciliation and generational support and, you know, uh, a, a world beyond sexism and, and all the things that you, you dream of when you're a kid that, that it got him killed. And, and so I became fascinated by how do you keep a dream alive? Um, and more importantly, how do you get a dream across if, if people are, are afraid of new ideas so much that they'll kill somebody? You know, how do you keep a dream going? And so as a young man, I set out and pursued a career in, in the world of music and, and entertainment. I ran nightclubs in Washington, D.C., because I, I became fascinated. And this will come in handy later in our conversation is sometimes how do you, you have to lure people to hear new ideas. You know, it's it's not most people aren't bad. And we'll get this out of the way early because I tend to be profane. But I got this little tattoo years ago because it's easy to do this. You know, and, and what I tried to do with this tattoo is remind myself, most people aren't evil or bad or, or dumb. They're just afraid. And that that really what you have to aspire to is make people brave enough to hear new things, to, to experience new things, to believe new ideas. So for me, music, theater, comedy was a brilliant mechanism because it was safe. People viewed it as entertainment. So that's what I did. I ran nightclubs. Uh, but after a night volunteering, um, uh, feeding people out on the streets of D.C., I, I just came back for this this sense of using a, a, a young man's kind of visioning or, or, or uh, open-mindedness and said, hey man, I work in a restaurant and, and, and a nightclub that throws away food every night and every restaurant I know does. Why don't we go get that food? Um, but more importantly, I thought, you know, the men and women I met on the street looked like they were hungry, but they certainly didn't look like they were unqualified to do a more, more powerful work in the community and own their own lives. So I thought, why not start a cooking school for the homeless at the same time? And you can actually shorten the line by the way you serve it, but everybody wins. Now, believe me, all of you, you know, your, your time has maybe come or it will come, but when you put forward a new idea and you assume people will hear it and think, wow, that's so smart. And you expect kind of, okay, now we'll get to it. Let's make it happen. And what you have to sometimes prepare yourself for is the, the tyranny of routine, that people get really comfortable with the status quo. And particularly if it works for them, hey man, my life's fine. Why do I want to mess this up? And that's what happened to me. I mean, everyone told me it wouldn't work. And I had to go out and kind of make it up as I went. And I kind of thought, to be honest with you, I'd get it going and then go back to running nightclubs. 
Anyway, I launched the, the um, DC Kitchen on Inauguration Day using the power of the inauguration and the symbolism of the President of the United States donating food from an, an inauguration to people who were poor and to start a job training program. And it worked. And that brought media, as I mentioned earlier, from all around the world. What media outlet can resist that kind of imagery, food from the inauguration, uh, all that stuff? But it's interesting because I spent the first two or three years, and maybe even more than that, really working hard to create a, a great nonprofit. I mean, a great nonprofit. I mean, one that, that had impacted every level. But at the end of the day, I had to look in the mirror and say, you know, no matter how cool I make this thing, I'm still feeding working people in America leftover food from restaurants. And no matter how cool I make that, it ain't right. And that's what really got me on that idea of like, it's, it's almost wrong if I just sat back and did something that in my head knew was, I, I knew wasn't enough, that I felt like, okay, what's the next step? And that's really what got me on the kind of advocacy journey. No, that's amazing. And um, something that I loved, like we, I had the opportunity to chat with Robert a little bit last week. And uh, something that you said that really stood out to me was that you were inspired to create DC Central Kitchen based on a model uh, or a, with a model that was based on liberation and not satiation. Can you just explain that a little bit more, yeah. that sentiment to, to the listeners here? Yeah, I mean, that's always been important to me. I, I, I never wanted to be a, a, and I'll be honest with you, brothers and sisters, you have to understand, as I mentioned, I went out on a food truck that did straight out, they just fed people every night. And I asked them, could we do more? And their attitude was, this is what we do. And I went to all the different food groups in DC at the time and asked them, I actually, I didn't want to do it. I was just trying to give this, what I thought was a great idea of, again, you can feed more people, better food for less money and shorten the line at the same time. And none of the food groups would do it. So there was an element of saying, you know, I don't know how it happened, but they become comfortable with this system. And I've said it many times that the model I, I, I witnessed was traditional charity, which is based on the redemption of the giver, not the liberation of the receiver. And so many of the things I've done in my career were based on, and this sounds kind of flip, but I, I almost said I'm going to do the opposite of whatever traditional charities do. You know, charities didn't make their own money. I started social businesses. Uh, charities didn't do marketing as much. And I felt people wanted to hear good news. They, they were desperate for something that made them feel like charity and, and nonprofits were, were part of the solution. Uh, and more importantly, you know, again, I go back to that idea of I, I wanted to see people step up and own their own lives, not be indentured to the kindness of, of, of people who, again, no disrespect, because most people who were involved were desperately just trying to do what's right. And there's nothing wrong with redemption. I need it just as much as anybody, even more so, but just not at the expense of another human. So that if it's set up, maybe we can all be redeemed simultaneously. So not only was it based on liberation, but the DC kitchen, all my kitchens have been based on side by side. Everybody works because one of the best forms of advocacy is helping people overcome prejudices and bigotries and fears that we all have. And I knew that most people, when they came into volunteer, we had almost 10,000 people a year coming to volunteer. And it was almost by accident. And I urge you in your work to be very open-eyed, like really, I'm not exaggerating, but open your eyes, you know, really see things during your daily work. Because one day early on, we had a group of doctors come in to volunteer. And I, I, I was rushing around because it was a very small staff at the time. And I asked one of our students to get the doctors acclimated. And as I turned to leave the room, I noticed they were literally frozen in place looking at each other the doctors being scared to death of a homeless person with a knife. They were burdened by these fears, unfounded, but burdened. And of course, at the same time, the, the man I had asked them to, uh, to, to help them get settled was also confronted by his own sense of, I'm not worthy. These are doctors, I'm lesser than them. And I came back about 20 minutes later and they're all laughing and talking and here's the student teaching them how to cut things. And I realized that was the profound power of our work is that if I could bring thousands of people that included presidents of the United States in to experience this idea of charity alone can't solve the problem. But if we as a community can stand side by side and work together, that'll get us a whole lot further down the road. And so that idea of both overt liberation theology, everything about us was, you know, I've said, it isn't how many pounds of food you move, it's how much liberation you squeeze out of every ounce you get that makes an organization really, truly badass. 
But again, that also that idea of it doesn't work unless the community at large sees their, their kind of shared journey. Um, and that's, I think, our biggest conundrum. And, and I think what leads us into the discussion about how do you do that through advocacy? No, that's amazing. And, and thank you, Robert, so much for sharing more about you know, what has propelled you throughout your career and your life to stay engaged on these issues. Um, and something that you said, like, really struck me, uh, people getting comfortable with the status quo. Um, so I, I did want to, I might switch gears a little bit here, but I wanted to ask you, um, especially, you know, the last few years during the pandemic, it feels like a huge spotlight has been placed on issues of poverty, hunger, and systems that continue to perpetuate inequity in the U.S. And so I just wanted to hear from you, what role do you feel that the pandemic has had on, you know, the social justice movement um, on our food system in general? Well, flat out, first off, the majority of people who passed were elders. Um, and what you're seeing now, I think, is the ramifications of our food system in America. It's rarely discussed, but the majority of people who passed, um, they, were, they were really knocked for a loop because of, you know, pre-existing conditions underlying conditions. And the majority of those were chronic diet related illnesses, including diabetes, hypertension, obesity. Now this is where it gets hardcore. And I, I tend to be pretty blunt at times, but this is one of the moments where I think it should have elicited from our movement, a very kind of a moment of clarity saying, have we participated? Have we merely passed whatever food is, is donated from the broader society down under the poor in the name of feeding them? Have we been poisoning people for decades with all this junk food that, that came out of processed America? Have we, have we taken enough care in our pursuit of pounds moved to really think about pounds of what? So that's an important thing. But let's stick to this. If you, and I'm gonna stay blunt if you don't mind. If you look at the system that exists, we still tell people in, in, as we distribute food, a lot of our work collectively here is gathering the food, but then we rely on partners to distribute food, You know, whether it's a pantry, a shelter, a, a domestic violence, place, whatever. But if you think about that, that system, it still says, if you're old, go over to this line. If you're a child, go over to this line. And if you wanna self-identify as poor and stand in my line over here, I'll give you a box of whatever I can scrape together. And again, I know that it's, it's, it's done with the best of intentions, but this is where the tyranny of routine comes in. Just because people have done it forever doesn't make it right. And I think that's the imperative of youth and all the men and women in the audience today is to really ponder and think, if I'm going to go into this movement, do I want to just go in kind of with one eye closed and say, well, this is the way it's been done. I'm going to make it a little bit better. Or do I want to have the courage to really stop and say, is there a different way? I mean, you know, up, up until my generation, uh, you know, your generation is the biggest, um, the most educated, the most technologically advanced, the most culturally open of any generation in the history of the world. You know, it's your time. Um, I always get kind of bummed when I hear generation, my generation say, you know, your generation next. And it's like, fuck that, your generation now. You know, this is your world. And I think you have every right. And, and it's your almost responsibility if you're going to go into this field to challenge some of the orthodoxies and say, you know, cool. Hey, man, no bad, no disrespect. I know you did what you thought was right. But that doesn't mean our generation has to do the same thing. We're going to try and take it a little bit of a different direction. And I think this is where advocacy in all its forms um, can be fulfilling along with the day to day work. And are there any specific um, efforts at this time that get you really excited and jazzed about, you know, now that you're talking about like our current generation and, uh, you know, younger people getting involved? Um, are there things that stand out to you that you would want to share with the group here? Tons, uh, you know, um, honestly, um, well, A, first and foremost, I really think this should be, in all, in all honesty, a moment where every food organization has a discussion amongst themselves and, and comes up with kind of a nutritional line in the sand. What will we distribute and what will we not? And it's tough because we all know when you're relying on donors to donate food, you don't wanna go there and say, well, we can take that, but not that. It's very difficult. But that idea of saying we can't, knowing what we know now post pandemic and the role that played, not only do we have to be aware 
that the food we are distributing with love in our hearts might be physically detrimental to people. But maybe what we need to be doing is opposite saying, we're only going to move food that actually strengthens people's immune systems, makes, makes them stronger. Um, and that might take kind of letting go of the idea of how many pounds of food did we move last year and, and experimenting. I'll be honest with you, one of the experiments I really wanted to play with for a while was saying, look, if I say I moved a pound of oranges, theoretically, I could figure out how much vitamin C was in a pound of oranges, and I could start to measure nutrients that we moved versus pounds of what we moved. So in effect, we could say last year, we moved this much in weight, but that included this much, and, and find a way to retranslate that so the average citizen could understand it. But I think pounds moved has been uh, a, something that has led us down a very wrong path. Um, so that idea of, of internal advocacy, what are we going to participate in and what are we going to say no to? That's one thing. Now, it may seem like a really weirdo thing to hang my hat on, but procurement reform is a profoundly important issue because whether it's whether you dream of being a social enterprise that does some kind of business involving food, that might include things like, wow, wouldn't I, I'd love to be involved in school food or senior meals, or parks and recreation, or even prison, reforming prison food. These are all important things. But what I learned, frankly, the hard way when I went out to Los Angeles and tried to take the knowledge I had gained in DC, where DC Kitchen now does, I think, seven or 8,000 meals a day for DC public schools. And that's allowed them to employ well over 120 people at more than a living wage and full benefits. Um, I thought I'd, I'd use that same kind of entrepreneurial spirit to, to really jump into the middle of senior meals. It's one of the most under-discussed. In fact, it is the most under-discussed issue in our movement. Um, and I think it's profound because, and again, don't get me wrong. It's not like I heart old people. This is just, I'm a pro. And this is who's next to be really, truly, deeply hungry and isolated, which is an evil cousin. Um, so I really wanted to get into that movement. And I really wanted to, as we did in DC, contract with the city to do school food. But what I found is when you contract, and I knew this, um, too often, A, contracts are, are given to whoever is the lowest bid. In other words, the person who says, I'll do it the cheapest. Now, again, the pandemic should, uh, among many things, again, highlight this issue of what we feed our kids, sets them on a, on a kind of a path of life to success, um, the ability to retain knowledge, gain knowledge, um, all those kind of things. So the idea that we're, we're doling out contracts to whoever's cheapest. Um, so I became interested in this idea of how do we decide who gets these contracts and it's just not right. So I've done a lot of work trying to help people understand. And for those of you all who are interested in local work, this is a very important thing because even the smallest towns, they have to decide where, who's going to serve our children food, who's going to serve our elders, and a wide variety of other projects. And it's not a, it's not a, 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 a small amount of money. You know, meals cost a lot to produce. So, you know, this is a very significant contract. And what I found is that majority, I mean, the vast majority are groups that go to multinational companies that, frankly, um, don't have any vital interest. Um, it, you know, obviously, anybody in food service cares, but... At the end of the day, their job is to make profit for their shareholders. That's capitalism. And so the idea of that's their number one goal, which means amongst many things, they're going to take any profit and it's going to leave town and never come back. So why wouldn't a local government stop and say, hold it, time out. You're telling me there's an alternate model than a big for-profit multinational company that hires people from the local community, oftentimes buys local food at a good rate and reinvest all its profit, how do I get more of those? Well, I think that social enterprises is a powerful tool. And I think most mayors don't know about it. So that idea of saying, A, how do we help, not only help elected people understand the power of the food that might be wasted, the contracts that are being wasted, the opportunities for social enterprise to come in and, and not only um, meet a need, in other words, we'll provide all these meals for kids, but we'll do it in a way that actually makes the community stronger, not lesser. Um, so helping to, people to understand that opportunity. Second is to help elect a generation of people who already understand that. And to me, this is um, one of the areas where I've spent a lot of my time and young brothers and sisters, it ain't easy time, but I spent the better part of 20 years saying to 
my colleagues in the nonprofit sector, our model is historically waiting for the powers that be to elect somebody. And then we assume it's now our time to go in and make an appointment and go in and try and educate them on our issue versus doesn't it make more sense to elect somebody who's really aware of what we do, believes in it, uh, profoundly enough to be a partner on day one? Um, so that idea of instead of crossing our fingers, let's get to work and elect people. So, and, and we can get into in a little bit, um, you know, Aaron, if you'll remind me, let's go back to talk about what nonprofits can or can't do within election processes. Sure. But that idea of, of both educating uh, elected people about what is possible, electing people who understand, but then also the reform needed to say that for contracts, let's change the model from whoever's the lowest bid to whoever provides the best value. Now, I did work in Los Angeles County, and it didn't benefit me. It wasn't, I wasn't going to do business in, in, in LA County. I lived in LA, but I knew that if we could get one major city to adopt this idea of actually registering social enterprises, and then in turn, giving those social enterprises priority treatment in any contracting bid based on things like wages paid, sourcing, redistributing profits. Those are the kind of things. And, and LA County was the very first county to create that registration process. So to me, that's a good example of advocacy. It was smart. It was good business for everybody. And my advocacy wasn't, bad, wasn't exclusively about what I would gain, but what our movement would gain. So wonderful, Robert. Thank you. And I know there is a question that I, I do want to bring to you from you know one of the, the folks on our call today. Um, so Augusto has asked, is there a framework already uh, to propose, oh sorry, already proposed to local governments um, regarding procurement reform and who is doing it well? There is, and thank you, Augusto, for that. And, and I wish I knew where you were from because I'd love to be able to, uh, and please, so if, when you ask a question, if you choose to, let me know where you're from because I've traveled and, and, and spoken at, at myriad uh, of campuses as well as launching campus kitchens in the in the 1990s and early 2000s. So I'd love to make it uh, germane to you and where you live. But anyway, yeah, in fact, um, there is a group that is promoting a, a thing called the Good Food Purchasing Act. And these are these are being passed very much around the country right now. And it basically says, if your city government spends more than, and you know, it's it's a kind of a sliding scale number, but ten thousand dollars is a good benchmark. If you're spending more than ten thousand dollars a year on contracts for food, then you need to check these boxes, and that includes sourcing local, um, you know, water, you know, your water policies, all these kind of things. Now, most of these, and it's one of the reasons I went to Los Angeles because the LA Food Policy Council and food policy councils were another important idea that could also be part of campuses. You could have campus food policy councils also that participate in cities food policy council. Anyway, LA had passed that. So I thought, dang, I'm going to go out to LA. They've got this, this, this new regulation and the big multinational caterer doesn't do any of those things. I do every single one. This will give me a wild competitive advantage. But they weren't mandatory. And I think that's a difference between things that look good, sound good, and feel good versus things that are really designed to get the result you want. And I think what's important, as much as I applaud the Good Food Purchasing Act and the many cities that are passing them, what I found in life is that many city councils want to do progressive legislation. And they're, they're really all, they're all for it when it comes to a simple vote. But then actually the follow-up and actually following up and making sure that these city agencies are doing what they're saying that's a very different matter. And that's what I encountered was a city that had joyfully passed an ordinance, but wouldn't enforce it, even when I revealed to them how um, negligent uh, the Department of Aging was being during this process and how wildly um, uh, the favoritism they were showing this big multinational company. And what, I guess, inspired you to keep driving for that change? You know, once you realize they're not, these government officials aren't holding themselves accountable to this policy they put into place. Like, you know, what keeps driving you to go back and remind them, like you've committed to this. I feel like that's well, a big ask. And for anybody here who might be, you know, have some anxiety around that, what advice do you have to share? Well, I mean, you know, look, I'm a white dude in America 
And, and because of that, you know, I was born with confidence. And I think when we talk about race and, and privilege, I think what's rarely discussed is confidence. And confidence is a massive tool because it gives you that sense of, I can do this, or my opinion matters, or they'll, they'll, they'll rue the day they messed with me. And I think that that's a big part of what has made me succeed is there was a sense of, I can achieve this. And so I don't want to, I don't want to underplay or underestimate the role that plays in the work I do. But at the same time, there's just this fierce sense of right, wrong. Um, and, and, you know, there's an old saying uh, in our movement, um, and I forget the name of the Archbishop Romero, I think, who might have said it, but it was something to the effect of, when I fed the poor, they called me a saint. When I asked why they were poor, they called me a communist. And this is a very important thing, because when you, when you deliver food to people, and I'll use my, my dear long-term colleague, Jose, as an example. Many of y'all see Jose and World Central Kitchen. We're in the Ukraine right now, uh, as well as um, down in New Orleans and a dozen other cities. But people love Jose. And, but people love right now, the majority of people love Saint Jose. You know, the majority of comments you see is, oh, he's a saint. Oh, he deserves a Nobel Peace Prize. Jose is a strong advocate, but it's an all, it's a very, very powerful moment when you decide I'm going to speak truth to power here because a lot of times people don't want to hear it. And so I urge you all who are thinking about advocacy to realize that sometimes people like the status quo. They don't want to be wrestled. They don't want, they'd rather think, oh, you're a saint for feeding poor than thinking about wage in America or prison or, or mental health in America. And these are profound issues that aren't just going to magically go away. But let's think about this for a second, because I think I was a little bit at times too um, self-righteous. I think that's probably a good word for it. There's a sense of it was easy to, let's put the, it, was, it was easy for people to dismiss me because they will. They'll say, oh, you're a bomb thrower. Um, oh, you're a dick. Oh, you're, you know, pardon me. But I mean, oh, there's a thousand reasons people will put it on you for their inaction. And they're going to want to do that. So sometimes you have to be diabolical. And I go back to my original um, kind of course of action with the nightclub was I'm going to trick them into hearing something they don't. If if I said, come and hear a speech on social justice in America, people would say, I don't want to do that. But anytime you watch Oprah, anytime you go to a Bruce Springsteen show or a thousand other performers, you're getting a, a kind of a, a subliminal. I call it the calculated epiphany. This idea of I know what I want people to think but I'm not going to be clumsy and tell them what to think. It's more important that it's their idea. So I urge you to think about um, uh, uh, advocacy as a little bit of a diabolical thing, because sure, we can be right and just and pure and true, but the point is not us being right and pure and true and just, it's getting other people to join us in that quest. So um, ex for example, again, as I've said many times, we had thousands of volunteers, but I felt like that if I would just shut up and instead of telling them what I thought was going to happen by them working side by side with somebody who was different, a different background than they did, uh, you know, that idea of, wow, you'll have this great awakening. You'll realize that people who were in prison aren't necessarily somebody you need to be afraid of or somebody who prays differently than you do is somebody you need to be fearful of. If they could have that, that, that kind of awakening on their own, that's a much more powerful thing because then they want to tell their friends. So that idea sometimes is disguising what you do, this Trojan horse. And I use that metaphor constantly. Um, but it's like, I would urge you, for example, those of you in the audience who might have suggested you were interested in local work, go to city council members, study the council members, you know, who's interested in something. And it might not, they might not stand up and say, I'm against hunger. They might say something like, I want our kids to succeed. And you're like, great, find them, hunt them down and say, you know, I couldn't help but be so overwhelmed by your passion about kids succeeding. Have you ever thought about school lunch and the role that plays in making sure kids have the, you know, the long-term ability to retain knowledge, gain knowledge, and thrive in our society? And they might say, in effect, I never really thought about that. Do you have any ideas? But that's something I've done constantly is, is I try and understand who's in positions of power, what motivates them, is there an angle that I can kind of get in? You know what I mean? Because sometimes if you come, it come at somebody face on, um, it can, they can put up that wall too fast. And I think part of our work has to be sophisticated enough and, and at, at times um, patient enough. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying as many elders do, you'll, you'll understand later and, and be, you know, be patient. It's a marathon, not a sprint. No, that's not what I'm saying. It's just 
be diabolical. And I really, I love that word because it's, it's not, it's not a bad word. It's just saying, be really smart. Think, how can I get in their, 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 their walls are up. You know, they're, they got the, in fact, that's always been my thing. The majority of people, they have big fat walls built up to here. They just want to peek over. That's what charity does. Charity allows people to, the average person to look over the walls and, and throw a check over and say, you know, let me know when it's all fixed. Um, I gave to charity, you know, that idea of that next step, whether it's volunteering, whether it's becoming an advocate, whether it's making sure people get out to vote, making sure people are registered to vote, or even develop, helping develop um, policy. And I'm sorry, not to be long-winded, but Regina mentioned, or I think, Aaron, I'm sorry, you did, the Bill Emerson Act. Yeah, yes, I did. When Bill Clinton was elected, again, we had made it kind of our, our, our claim to fame, for lack of a better phrase, to pick up food from the inauguration. And then we started baking cookies and cakes and stuff for the inauguration. Um, the Clintons and their administration were really interested in this issue, but most importantly, Dan Glickman, who was the Secretary of Agriculture, no one had ever done a study on food waste before. So here we were right across the mall and the Clintons and, and Secretary Glickman used to come to volunteer we started talking. It's like, hey, there's never been a study on how much food is wasted. Why don't we start looking at it? And why don't we do something about it? And so that led to a long discussion that culminated in, you know, dudes, I didn't go to college. I barely graduated high school, but here I was helping to fashion, you know, an act that, that I went to the White House in 1996 and got to see Bill Clinton sign the Bill Emerson Act. Um, and that just was, all that did was take a moment in which the secretary came here to put a bug in his ear, to find that way in to get a bug in and actually develop, a, a, frankly, a, a to this day friendship that has culminated in not only the, the Good Food Purchasing Act, but again, the first study and the, and the kind of the beginnings of the movement to make sure that food isn't wasted. That's great, Robert. Thank you so much. And actually, this is perfect timing. We have a question from yeah. another person on the call with us today. And I know we only have, I can't even believe how quickly time has gone by, but we only have like 12 minutes left of this conversation. I know we could sit here and talk all day. I know we could. So um, I, I want to be sure to share, you know, this question from Lauren, uh, who's in Kansas City. Are there different tactics for advocacy as an individual versus advocacy from an organization? Yeah, very much so. In fact, um, A, just a second, I am typing my email into the chat. Um, so if, if any of you all want to follow up, I, again, as Regina said, I'm, I'm always open to talking and sharing ideas. Um, and A, I love KC. I've done so much work in Kansas City, including taking a drive out to Little Manhattan. I know we got folks uh, out in the audience there uh, 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 from, uh, uh, Manhattan, Kansas. Um, yeah, but I, I, I think that what's important also is the alliances you form. In other words, it's, it's, it's one thing for one organization to come in and say, here's our idea, but if you can have a coalition of organizations and coalition building can be incredibly hard, incredibly hard. It takes patience, maturity, because, you know, you're always going to have different ideas. But again, if you embrace, and I urge you to ponder that 4951, if it's that, if it's got a, I'm going to bite my tongue because it's for the greater good, you know, the better, you know, we're better together. So that's one thing. Um, but yeah, dude, don't, in my opinion, I think it all begins with your own brain, you know, and, and I urge you um, to be informed about what's going on. Now, again, I, I, I've already explained how lucky I am in my, my career, but I grew up in Washington, D.C., where I was at the power, seat of power. And I, I really, I went to congressional hearings all the time. I went to city council member meetings. I read every single, the daily newspapers. I wanted to understand how policy happens, how politicians think, how they're funded, you know, uh, and, and start to find the, the, the way in to get their ear, to get their attention. Now, I, I'm gonna give you another example. I, I mentioned Jose, do not think this is easy because Jose um, earlier uh, it, before the election really wanted to see a department of food and nutrition. And, and he talked to every politician and they'll say, yes, yes, yes. Oh my God, I love you. Of course we're gonna do this. No movement on this whatsoever. In fact, I've watched um, uh, Jim McGovern who's the congressperson up in Massachusetts work for the better part of 10 years to get a White House summit on food and nutrition, hunger and nutrition, which he finally just got. It's a long haul, but it's this idea of Educating yourself, and, and I would urge you, 
that even though you might be from a different city than where you live right now, this might seem like this is where I go to school. This is where you live. Where you are is where you live. And frankly, many of you all will stay in the towns you went to college in. So that idea of it's never too young or, or it's never, there's never a wrong time to understand the environment you are living and working in. So go to your city council member meetings and really listen, find those allies and befriend them and never underestimate most elected people. You think they got it all figured out. 99% of the time, you know what they want from advocates? They want ideas. Tell us what to do. So there's nothing wrong with actually saying, I have an idea and I'm going to think it through and create a policy idea around it and actually giving it to them saying, I've got it pretty much figured out. Here's what it could look like. you know. And for example, let's go back to that idea of the Good Food Purchasing Act. To go to a city council member that you know has expressed an openness to whether it's sustainable sustainability, the environment, um, any human services issue, and just say, you know, we ought to really take a deeper dive into our food system here. It's not, you know, we're spending a lot of money on food. There's a huge generation of people who are interested in food. The pandemic revealed the power of food to both heal, but also may put people in a bad position. Let's really fundamentally look at our food system and maybe there's an electoral opportunity for you as a city council member, if you aspire to be mayor, maybe this could be an issue you could really, really hang your hat on and ride for a while. Because I really think we underestimate people's interest in food. And conversely, and I'll kind of start to wind this up. Um, you know, last July 4th, I wrote an, uh, an article for Civil Eats. And Civil Eats, I urge you to potentially sign up and subscribe because it is probably the best, in my opinion, one of the best sources of news about food, policy, social justice work out there. They're really good. And also, they're open to writers. And I've written for them many times. And I just actually reached out um, and asked if I could write for them. And they said, sure. And never underestimate the power of the written word, brothers and sisters. I, the first time I was young and I submitted something to the Washington Post and got it printed, I was shocked that they would let a dope like me write for the Washington Post. But they want new ideas. So don't be afraid to some, put your ideas out there. Um, oh, my goodness. Robert, I, think I know. I was like, I know we're like winding down the time. There is one one thing oh. that you flagged for me to bring back up to you. And I know since we only have a few minutes left, um, we can go this route. We can go a different route. But if you okay. want the option to circle back about what nonprofits can or can't do with elected officials, if you have yeah. enough time. <laughs> yeah, in theory, uh, the, the one thing, the really the, the third rail is you can't endorse a candidate. And that's really the number one thing. You can, you can do all kinds of things. And there's so many different books and, and organizations that will help you understand the role of advocacy. And again, whether that's voter registration, whether that's candidate forums, and think about this, you know, when you see many of these candidate forums, particularly presidential, they're at universities. So the power you will have as students to ask people, you know, who want to run for office, how would you partner with us as the nonprofit sector to diminish the need for charity in America? What a profound question. And you can ask that. Actually, that kind of reminds me of, you know, something that I did want to touch on today. And again, I know we're limited on time here, but, um, you know, earlier in the conversation, you talked about feeding people with dignity. Um, providing healthy food to those in need. But I would also love to hear your thoughts on, you know, a policy that FRN is supporting. It's targeting providing people with a living wage so that they actually don't have to even rely on those programs to begin with. Um, and that's the fight for 15, which would increase, you know, the federal minimum wage from 725 per hour to $15 an hour. So I just wonder quickly, what are your thoughts on this movement towards, you know, a $15 minimum wage and, and how would that help support people in the long run? A thousand percent behind it. I've been an advisor to that organization. I've brokered a lot of pieces, peace between groups that are warring within this fight. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the question is, how do we feed people? Is how do we set people up so they don't need charity? And ultimately that's wage at the end of the day. Now, let's also... I, I would urge you that while Fight for 15 is imperative, at the same time, I think we need a dynamic new discussion about mental health in America, about prison in America, these kind of things. And, and hopefully the pandemic should have, again, revealed the ability of workforce flexibility. I mean, look at us right now. You know, in, in days past, this would have been at a national conference. I would have had to jet in, pack my bags, leave my family. And here we can simply, um, with the push of a button. So. 
now is a, is a perfect time for a younger generation to really say, that's not the life I want to lead. That's not the job I want. That's not, you know, and, and push corporate America, for lack of a better phrase, to accept more responsibility for its employees. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big, big believer, but I also as a federal law. I think it needs to be a federal law, not piecemeal yeah. across the country, because that just pits no, cities against one another. Um, and in our final moments here together, Robert, I just wonder, do you have any last pieces of advice or inspiration or like a thought that you really want to want to share with our our network here today? Yeah. Um, it, you know, as funny as it sounds, tomorrow I go to the airport and I pick up two friends from high school. And on Thursday, another friend is driving down to join us. And I'm actually so happy that I still have friends from that phase of my life. And that's because I've, I've nurtured those friendships. You know, I've worked hard to keep them alive. I send notes and letters. I remember birthdays and dudes, I'm no saint, but I mean, I just, I make an effort. And there's been many times in my life and career where I've been frustrated. Advocacy, probably the number one issue. And I've turned to those friends and, 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 and asked them to remind me that I can still do this, that I'm not, you know, that, that I've got the tenacity and the courage to keep moving forward. You're not an island under yourself. And some of the best friends you have are maybe back home in your hometown where you went to school. It might be, you know, the, the friends you braided your hair or, or you did double Dutch with, or you took long bike rides. You just sat out in front and threw a baseball to one another while you talked about the mystery of the world. But those are the, some of the best friends. And I urge you to nurture those friends because you can't be a badass without friends. Oh my gosh, that's so great, Robert. <laughs> and I know that we're all, you know, very close friends in our community here. Um, so Robert, just thank you so much for being here, for sharing your thoughts and ideas. I feel like I could really go down a lot of different like conversation pathways with you, uh, which makes it hard with the time constraint. But I know I'm sure everybody's walking away with uh, something interesting to think about and to kind of sit on uh, in, in, you know, the days and months and years to come. So thank you. Well, I, it's been my honor. And again, thanks to Regina for her longtime friendships and leadership. Aaron, Elaine, thank you both. Uh, and to everyone who took time out of your busy day to hang with this old coot and listen to my ramblings, I, I'm grateful. And I really want to be uh, overt in that you have my, my email and I always respond. Um, so if I can help you on your journey, never hesitate. Thank you all so much. And, and, and know that Robert means every word that he has said. So please be in touch. The invitation is there. I was able to take Robert up on, on that offer many years ago. Um, and here we are today. So um, no, no person is an island unto themselves. Um, Robert, Aaron, Elaine, thank you all so much. Thank you everyone for listening. Um, so much love to everyone. Please be safe and get in touch with a friend that you haven't been in touch with for a little while. I think that's a good first step. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody.